I can think so many other more beautiful places in the world, <laughs> but the people, you will miss that. That's my father, Fidenzio. We've lived in the Amesbury area of Toronto for some time, my whole life practically, and like him, I always thought the area was, well, impersonal, at least on the outside. It's pretty generic in terms of, you know, a suburban area here in Toronto, one of the older suburban areas. Uh, it doesn't have anything really truly iconic in terms of architecture, urban design, landscape architecture, but it's got a lot of character. And uh, I think the character really comes from the people and from the activities that happens in, in this area. You can drive through this area and, and once you're out of it, I'm sure you will not remember any of it other than that wall which is unique and people love it. And we want the south side of our wall to be done as right. well. I heard hints of life in Amesbury, listening to my dad. He reminded me that despite its generic appearance, there exists a unique spirit within it. One that brings people happily together. This is hard to miss at the Bocce courts. The sport Bocce was um, one of the favorite sports from mm -hmm. the immigrants that arrived from, from Italy. And we played Bocce in Italy, and uh, when we came over here, uh, we want to continue with, with the tradition. Right. Uh, after a while, you become a family, which is nice, yes. but it's also the sport. They, they love it. They, and when they play, they play to win. This, is, this, this sport is like a drug. I mean, once you get hooked up, it, it's hard to go. You, you know, once you start playing and enjoying it, that's it. You're here forever. Bocce um, it's a really. is a passion. Yeah. Uh, the funny things that um, now that I represent a um, veterans of Italian origin in Canada, in Ontario, I've learned lots more about it. Like uh, during the, um, the time of war, and they were uh, detained by uh, Germans, they used to play bocce, not with a ball, with a stone. Uh, they used to find stone. So this is something that uh, they had nothing to do. It's like uh, basketball was, uh, it was created in, in Canada by inmates. That's, that's the only problem, only for the, the old people. We were young and we were playing uh, young people, young people, then we got older and nobody came in. Okay. Not the young people come in. It's a beautiful sport. Yes. Because you can play and that's what I say. It's a young man, 85 years old. 86. He's a good, good player. Still. How does it work? You have mostly, you have sort of, you have mostly men. No, actually, or is it both women? At, because I see the women in that court that, over that, there. That's a team. They came from the states. Okay. They're gonna play against men because some of the women they're better than men, so they came. They're the best. Those those ladies over there. Primarily, when I come here, um, I'm usually the only one or two or three women players, which. You can't let it discourage you. We hope that people will recognize that and say, wow, they're there by themselves, maybe I'll join you. So we're hoping women will recognize that and be a part of it. Yes. Um, it makes me just want to try harder when you're the only woman in the crowd. Uh, physically, you don't have to be this major athlete to get out there and do it. Anybody can do it. So it, it caters to that. Good examples of life in Amesbury are by no means limited to sport. In the area's many places of worship, people are full of spirit. Watch your attitude and how you worship this morning. Don't bring him down to entertainment. Don't bring him down to the familiarity. He deserves your breath, every breath, every breath, every breath, every breath inside of you, he deserves it. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. very hard to find facilities in, the, in, in Toronto that facilitate parking and the amount of people that we have here. And we also wanted to be a, a church that had the multicultural uh, side of things. We have over 65 different nationalities, different countries, people come from different parts. And um, it, we just believed in love, love and compassion and um, trying to be relevant to where people's lives are. And people come because you answer questions where people are hurting. And I think that has been a success of um, us growing as an organization, moving from the downtown, coming up 
more in the industrial because we couldn't really find a building to facilitate the growth of the, the organization. Uh, when we got this building, it was it was a raw, with all due respect, dirty, mm -hmm. no, there, there was nothing inside it, it was just a shell. Mm -hmm. And um, we know that, you know, the people and the love that the people bring, we start working on this place and you see what we have done with it. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I really believe it's the community, it's the relationships that, uh, mm -hmm. that is developed here. People would go anywhere where they feel love and accepted and love, um, just feel like a family. Not one to rush into decisions, I wasn't ready to sign up for even Pastor Marcus's lively church. But leaving it, I did feel the love he was talking about. I was expecting, yes, even looking forward to experiencing similar at Greenboro Community Church, one of the oldest places of worship in Amesbury. But I was met with something different. Reservations about modern life. You know, the kids go, all they're all fragmented. One goes to Catholic school, one goes to this, and one is bused. You know, the worst thing we ever did was busing. You know, we got away from our communities, we got away from what I think is the fabric of society is, you know, I, I don't get a real good feeling, you know. You got people get up in the morning, they get up at six o'clock in the morning. You know, they're sitting on the road for two hours to get to somewhere God knows where, right? And it takes them an hour and a half to come back. Where when my dad worked, it was 20 minutes. You know, he worked 20 minutes there, 20 minutes back, and that was it. So it's, I'm, I'm just glad that I did. I'm not part of that whole, that whole thing. It's just, it's very uh, stressful. I don't know if it's possible to go back to where, to where you've got, uh, like one big advantage we had when we were young is we had big families. You know, we had three and four kids and, and we had stable families. We didn't have, you know, 50% of the families uh, breaking up. You know, so we had some stability. So uh, it's hard to imagine um, anything different 20 years. I mean, on a bleaker, on a realistic scale, it's probably going to be worse than what we have now. Because I don't see, I, I don't see any, I see an environment that's collapsing. I see, you know, I, I'd like to be more optimistic because I'm an optimistic person, but realism has takes hold after a while and you say, you know, and, and people, people, unless people really want to change, unless, unless they're angry enough, it's like what's going on in Florida the, with the kids, right? There has to be a rebellion and, and uh, you know, um, it just has to happen or, or nothing will happen. Ben Hilda, who years ago fled Africa with her family to make Toronto her new home, was much more optimistic than Paul. It was easy for me to fall in love with her gracious personality, but I felt sadness in her words as she spoke about connecting with Canadian society. It's not easy to start a new life in Canada. When we came here, we left everything that we had back home, and um, we came here without anything. No plates, no, no pots to cook on, no way to live, so um, yeah, it was a big, big challenge. It was a big challenge, especially when you have kids. So when I when I came from Africa and came I came to Canada, um, the first time, um, what surprised me was the waste of food here. And then I said, um, where I come from, people don't throw away food. And it's not that my family are poor, no, that's not what I'm saying, but there's kids in Africa that are suffering, that just can afford one meal a day. And um, I've heard people complaining here um, of certain things that are not even worth complaining. That's, that's the difference. So um, I can do anything that I feel I can do and I can help uh, without complaining. But so, so there's certain things that we, we don't have to complain and we just have to think about other people before you start saying, oh, you know, complaining about anything. Stephanie is a philosopher. I'm a philosopher, <laughs> oh my gosh, no I'm not. Like Paul and Ben Hilda, Stephanie observes how we as a culture are not being mindful enough of what's important. 
and I think Stephanie poignantly captures why that's happening. We have too many distractions that takes us away from each other. So I, I, I don't know. At work, I, I like to tell my, uh, I argue a lot with my coworkers, and I like to tell them, you guys are all my, my children, you know? I will teach you what I want you to know, but you have to learn what you want to know. But it's, it, then that's how my father brought us up, to learn almost maybe just the basic stuff of who I am today. I'm not a perfect person, but I have learned a lot from the things that I've made mistakes in, and I've learned from the things that I've seen others have gone through that I think I don't want to, but how can we go up and go out and help? So it's, I'm a community person. Stephanie's idea of a community person stuck with me. If everyone were such an individual, we would worry less about people not working together to fix problems that affect them as a whole, like the polluting asphalt plant in Amesbury. We've been complaining all along, and it's come right out of the mouth of the commissioner that it's a lack of enforcement. We've been complaining for the longest time, and we feel that we haven't been heard, we've been ignored. You know, we're, I'm afraid for my health. You know, I, we're victims here and, and we deserve compensation. It's definitely affected our personal lives and our business. Two guys have died already here, here. you know, like what, what someone got to, you know, like does everyone have to die before something's yeah, done? Yeah, exactly. This asphalt and pollution is really affect people's health yes. because it's, it's a smoke, dust, noise, whatever, all affect people's health. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but this thing never get resolved. This uh, company continue. I report every <coughs> time the pollution affects us, but government did not follow up. Did nobody show up to, to take action to protect the citizen. That is government's fault. I say I have to continue call. Even I call hundred times, I can call thousand times, I have to take a call. This is my job. You know, it's definitely affecting my business. The noise is, is, is so tough, sometimes you can't even frust you get frustrated, you can't even think. You know, I gotta operate uh, most of the summer with the door closed. How fair is that? You know, and, and the dust is getting into uh, on and inside my customers' uh, cars. See that crack over there? You see that? I filled up half of it. See yeah, it's about to Like everything's falling apart, even the, even the floor. Well, you know, I mean, Bob's retired, right? You know, I'm 51. I still got a few years to go, right? And, you know, it's like I said before, I, I operate an automotive business, right? I got tools. I've got equipment, the hoist mounted to the floor. I got leased equipment. It's not like, uh, oh, I'm going to, you know, quit and go somewhere else and I, I just fill my uh, suitcase up and leave, right? I was here first. Yes. You know? I was here first, and this is my this is my only livelihood. And I think you know, but there has to also be this sort of alignment of values, you know, people actually caring in the government. It's a whole thing of money. By this point of my journey through Amesbury, disappointment was palpable. I knew this documentary wasn't going to depict the stereotypical suburban experience, where everyone is comfortable and happy. I turned to my artist friends Leo and Germinio for guidance. Sensitive to people's struggles, I felt they would be able to shed light on achieving greater communal satisfaction in Amesbury. I'd say um, hmm. the biggest challenge is just getting people to accept new. That's probably the hardest thing to do in, in a booming um, scene. In a scene where it's like there's not much going on, like you can hear something and be like, oh, it's really good. Like, Maybe that's going to be a good song one day, but like in this scene where it's like there's catalysts already and there's big voices and names already right. to get people to turn on to you and respect you, um, it takes a lot of effort. Like it takes so much effort for people to even take you serious. Leo's talking about becoming a successful rapper, but I already feel what he's saying applies to Amesbury. When you open up, it allows you to do things that you never imagined because you're now um, allowing people access to you that they never really thought was there before. Right. So if I'm always on like social media, like, yo, look at me, da, 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 da. I have this, I have that, and I'm doing this, but there's no interaction on the notifications and the likes and all that stuff, that's because those people don't know you. Those right. people don't really care for you. You can pay your 
your internet promo and all that. Right. But if no one really knows you, then you're just gonna go viral f- just to go viral, and like you may fizzle out, bro. Like you may just not have much going after a while. So yeah. it's good to connect with the people themselves, you know, Absolutely. and each other. Leo's right. It's hard to be heard among competing voices, and I think that's what's at the heart of the unhappier side of Amesbury. Those I was meeting in the area weren't afraid to open up in the way Leo described and certainly had more substance than any fleeting viral sensation. However, it seemed many of them felt disconnected from others, preventing them from affecting collective change for the better. But there is a solution. Paul, you, you like me with this glass or with the other one? Yeah, whatever you prefer. No. <laughs> yeah. Which one you prefer? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. I, I give you the I, choice. I like the round glasses. Yes. This one? Yes. Okay, I'm more intellectual. Yes. Myself as an artist, I live in my own world. So I'm protected by my creativity, you know? that uh, shields me from uh, all these problems around me. Yeah. So uh, I can, I can uh, uh, unload, unload in my work all the pressure that I see around me. But Germinio recognizes that's not enough to heal the world, let alone increase the well-being of Amesbury. We need us to, to open up our art in a way that really can see the divine. Yes. It's our job to do that. That's why we are alive. We, we have no other uh, function here that work hard, pray, and give what you have to people in needs. What do you need? What do you need? When you have a house, you have like food, you have a, a family, what do you need more than that? So what well, you need is just love. And until love becomes more widespread in Amesbury, its well-being will remain only a fraction of what it could be. As Germinio suggests, love means assuring one another's well-being, connecting us to those past and present who made that possible for us. I feel the Amesbury Community Committee is directly facilitating this in establishing the Canada Commons that will replace the lesser-used Boche Courts of Amesbury Park, where the diverse population of Amesbury will meet in a loving spirit of togetherness and reflecting the Commons' four pillars, do so while proudly honoring Canada's natural splendor, the founding nations, the Fathers of Confederation, and those who have sacrificed for the country's freedom. But like my father said, Amesbury is already special because of the people who live here. That's why, despite the challenges it faces, Amesbury is beautiful.